Good afternoon, everyone. I think we're going to get started. Um, I'm Ann Del Castillo, Commissioner of the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment. Um, as most of you know, um, our office uh, works to support, promote, and um, and strengthen New York City's creative sectors of film, television, theater, advertising, publishing, digital content, and video games. Um, our office comprises five divisions, uh, the Film Office, NYC Media, um, Office of Nightlife, Press Credentials Office, and Creative Sector Programs. Um, and these sectors represent 150 billion in economic activity for New York City, um, and close to half a million jobs, which represents about 10% of New York City's economy um, with uh, film and television production representing uh, the lion's share of that at 82 billion and close to 185,000 jobs. Um, what that doesn't necessarily account for are the um, numerous jobs and businesses that are supported by the film and television um, industry. Um, and so when we're talking about workers impacted by uh, the WGA strike, we're talking about more than people that are just working in production. We could be working in businesses such as catering, um, dry cleaning, lumber, um, hardware stores that typically provide support for um, the, the film and television uh, production sector. Um, this is actually our second webinar. The first one uh, that we held about a month ago, uh, we, we heard from many of you that uh, in addition to seeking information about unemployment benefits, that uh, a number of you are, were seeking information about public benefits and public assistance. Um, and so we are very fortunate to have been able to um, engage some of our uh, colleagues in government and the nonprofit sector uh, to do this follow-up session to provide that information. And so I, I just want to thank um, our panelists today. Vanessa uh, Mitchell from New York City Department of Social Services, Lars Thompson from New York State Department of Labor, Lillian Galena from the Entertainment Community Fund, Goldie Patrick from the Dramatist Guild Foundation, and Rafael Espinel and Jalen Vasquez from the Freelancers Hub. Um, I also want to acknowledge the team at MOM that worked very hard to put these webinars together, um, Tavri Crouch, Noel Mari, and Marisa Redanti, as well as our comms and marketing team for uh, getting the word out about these seminars. If there are individuals you know that wanted to participate but weren't able to make this time, we are um, going to be making a recording of this session available online and uh, we'll be sending that out after this session. Um, but again, I thank you for joining us um, and hope that you'll find today's session uh, helpful. And uh, now I'm going to turn it over to Tabri, who's going to be moderating today's session. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, as Commissioner mentioned, uh, this, this webinar is for, for all workers affected by the work stoppage. That includes uh, people working directly on, on set, as well as uh, support services, as ancillary services and businesses that support these productions. So, all right, starting off, uh, we have our first speaker, uh, Vanessa Mitchell, is the Community Engagement Liaison with the Office of Outreach. Uh, with New York City's Department of Social Services and Human Resources Administration. In her role as a community engagement liaison, Vanessa supports community partner organizations as they navigate the tools DSS slash HRA has developed to make the agency's services more accessible to New Yorkers and community providers. She has over 10 years of public sector and nonprofit experience. She obtained her master's in social work from Hunter College in 2018 and currently lives in the Bronx. So. Please welcome Vanessa. Hi, good afternoon and thank you um, for that introduction. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen since I have a PowerPoint um, just to keep me on track. I know I have five minutes, so I'm gonna try to um, make sure to I, that I stay within the time frame. So um, again, my name is Vanessa Mitchell. I am from the Department of Social Services. Um, I am from the community, from the Office of Community Outreach. So I will be talking a little bit about the core programs of DSS HRA. Um, and I will give you a quick overview of this. 
I will have some contact information towards the end. So in case you guys um, want to reach out in regards to any particular cases, applications, um, you are welcome to. So just to give you a quick overview of HRA, um, which is also known as the Department of Social Services, we are dedicated in fighting poverty, income equality by providing New Yorkers in need with essential benefits. HRA connects over 3 million New Yorkers to a variety of benefits and services to design to meet their social services and economic needs. HRA is committed to serving all New Yorkers, regardless of their race, re religion, sexual orientation, gender, identity, language proficiency, or disability status. Um, and I do want to mention that because a lot of people usually have a lot of questions in regards to immigration status. Um, regardless, people are welcome to apply. And the only way to find out if someone is eligible is if you apply. So I really encourage people to apply if they are interested in applying in a benefit or a service. Just to give you a quick overview, these are some of the core benefits and programs and some of the services that um, we provide for the most vulnerable New Yorkers. I'm not gonna touch on every single one, but I did wanna show you this slide just to give you a quick glance of some of the services that we do provide and that are available. So we have cash assistance, employment services, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, also known as food stamps, medical insurance, child support services, homeless prevention and services, home energy assistance program, fair fares, IDNYC, HIV aid services, home care services, adult protective services, domestic violence services, and community food connection and burial assistance. That was a mouthful, but those are some of the services that we provide. I wanna start by giving you a little bit information on Access HRA. This is a public facing website um, and this is available to anyone who is interested in applying for benefits like cash assistance, emergency assistance, HEAP, Fair Fair NYC. Um, you can do this through online as long as you have access to a computer. So you can go on to a public library, um, smartphone, and you can apply for any of these uh, benefits and recertify if you currently have an active case. So for people who have active cases, they can do so also by going on Access HRA and looking up the status of their case, recertifying any of their current active cases if it's coming up. They can also read e-notices um, to find out any updates on cases, updates on applications that have been submitted, most likely you have an e-notice in the Access HRA website if you have created an account. Along with that, you can also view payments and case details along with requesting budget letters. Um, one of the most recent updates that we've done with Access HRA is people can now renew their Medicaid cases for those that are 65 and older or legally disabled. So these are some of the few things that can be done on Access HRA along with seeing current active cases and the status. I also want to touch on Access HRA mobile app. So the Access HRA mobile app is another a feature of Access HRA, but it's more accessible because it's an app. So anyone can download it on their smartphone. It's free. You can basically see the same thing that you see on the pub the public facing website. Um, one of the benefits of having the app is that you can actually submit documentation after you submit your application by taking pictures and uploading them. So that is the benefit of having the app along with keeping track of your benefits. So in case you need to see how much money you have on your EBT card and see how much money um, maybe you have on cash assistance, you can see that information on the mobile app. Um, you can also read notices that you receive through Access HRA, and you can also uh, submit certain applications and make changes if needed through the mobile app. So there is one other app I want to mention, and that's called NYC HRA Document Upload. Um, this app is solely to submit documentation. And this can also be used if you submit an application through Access HRA. A lot of people find this to be easier sometimes than Access HRA. Um, again, this is solely to submit application. This is available to anyone 
um, that has submitted an application and wants to submit and uh, submit their documents, there is no need to sign in or create an account. So that is one of the shortcuts, I guess you can say for this app, um, there is no need to sign in. So it's as easy as just making sure that you know either a case number, a SIN number that's located on the EBT card, usually on the top left corner of the EBT card, that's also called ID number, or people can also use their access HRA confirmation number that they get at the end of submitting an application. The reason why these one of these things are needed is because when you submit an uh, when you submit your documents, you need to make sure that you attach those documents to the correct application. So again, one of those identifiers is required to be able to submit those uh, documents through this app. Again, it's just selecting identifier, taking a picture, and then uploading it. It's fairly easy. So I'm going to now go into cash assistance. That's also known as public assistance. Um, cash assistance is also available on Access HRA. Um, people are now able to complete their phone interview by calling HRA instead of waiting for a call from HRA. This recently got expanded, I want to say, in the last month. Um, so the first step is to submit the application through Access HRA. The second step is to submit to complete that phone interview by calling HRA. Um, there is also an application called a one-shot deal. That is also under uh, cash assistance. So the one-shot deal is a little bit different because it's a one-time benefit and it's an emergency assistance. So this is typically for people that are interested in needed, needing help with their rent arrears or utility arrears. They can apply for a one-shot deal through Access HRA. Um, they would also have to complete a phone interview. And again, the person applying would have to contact HRA all of that information is included on the confirmation page after submitting the application. And just to give you a little bit more information in regards to cash assistance um, and some of the qualifications needed or eligibility is there will be questions um, asked in order to see if the person is eligible for cash assistance. They will be asking about income and if there is no income, that's okay. You can put zero as income. Um, expenses like rent, utilities, childcare, medical expenses, if you are 65 or older or legally disabled, or if you have someone in your household that is legally disabled or 65 and older. Um, everyone, you will want to include everyone in your household. And then they will ask about immigration status. So they, if you're unsure of the immigration status, you can leave it blank. They don't have a social security number. You can leave the social security number blank. Um, but these are some of the, uh, the eligibility requirements that will be asked to see if you and your household are eligible. Again, the application is available on Access HRA. So the application be the application can be uh, submitted through Access HRA and submit the documentation through the mobile app, which is called Access HRA as well. Uh, families and family and children can receive up to 60 months of cash assistance um, from the program called TANF, which is also known as the Federal Temporary Assistance for Needy Families. Child care assistance is also available and can also be uh, completed through Access HRA. Single adults and adu adults that are couples without children can also apply for cash assistance or a one-shot deal. And now I'm going to go into SNAP. And SNAP is also known as food stamps. Um, so SNAP is also available on Access HRA. People can go on and apply for SNAP benefits. If, there, if you have an active SNAP case, you can also recertify through Access HRA. Um, you can submit periodic reports, change reports, make changes to your case through Access HRA. Um, you can also upload all your documentation through Access HRA mobile app. 
And the eligibility interview is also required just like cash assistance. Um, it's the same way clients would call um, HRA to complete that phone interview. And the phone number is 718-SNAP-NOW, Monday through Friday, 8.30 to 5. We usually suggest, just so people are aware, that Mondays are usually a high volume, so it may take a little bit of time for people to get through. Midday throughout the week is good. Um, and again, so that phone interview is required, and every if you do not complete that step, you will run the risk of being rejected. Sorry, I completely forgot about these. Um, Okay, so there are more than 1.6 million New Yorkers receiving SNAP benefits on a monthly basis. Um, to qualify for SNAP, an applicant must, must submit an application. Again, um, in order to find out if somebody qualifies for SNAP benefits, an application must be submitted. The SNAP household usually includes spouses, children living with or under parent control of an adult and biological or adoptive parent of children under the age of 22. So for a household um, who have 22 or younger should all be on the same application. Elderly, those that are 16 or over um, or have a disability, can apply with their spouses as well or separately. So those are people who are 60 or older or legally disabled. And again, we're just mentioning again, um, applicants are required to call 718 SNAP now to complete that eligibility interview. And some of the eligibility requirements would be including residency, proof of residency, uh, income, immigration status, and resources. Uh, single issuance benefits may be issued within seven days, which is also known as an emergency benefit, which is also known as a one-time benefit. Not everyone is eligible for that one-time benefit. However, even if you're not eligible for that one-time benefit, it does not mean that you're not eligible for ongoing benefits. It takes up to 30 days to find out, for, to find out if you were approved um, or not. NYC residents can apply for SNAP online through Access HRA. Applicants, again, are required to complete that phone interview um, and apply through Access HRA. So I wanna go through emergency assistance. Um, I mentioned this earlier. So emergency assistance can, is also known as like a one-shot deal. So people can apply for one-shot deals through Access HRA. Um, this to qualify applicants must be income and resource eligible and meet specific grant guidelines. Emergency grants can include rental assistance in case of impending eviction or rent arrears have occurred assistance with home energy and utility bills, new apartment expenses, first month's rent, security voucher, disaster assistance, including replacement of clothing or personal belongings. Um, new York City residents already in receipt of cash assistance can also request help with an emerging situation online using Access HRA by requesting a special grant. So just to summarize this, people who are in need of rent arrear, utility arrears, um, have gone through some crisis, emergency, whatever it, need, whatever it is, you can apply for an, a one-shot deal. If you have an active cash assistance case, you can apply for a special grant. And you can do all of this through Access HRA. Now a little bit about homelessness and prevention services. So we have rental assistance. HRA provides uh, rental assistance programs, um, including, sorry, including um, the prevention of emergency rental assistance to prevent evictions for low income families and individuals. Um, the operation of the Family Homelessness Eviction Prevention Supplement Program, also known as FEBS, 
for families with children on cash assistance who are facing eviction or are in the shelter and the city FEPS program that assists families and individuals in avoiding homelessness and if residing in shelter or relocating to permanent housing. The shelter system, so DHS provides temporary emergency shelter to homelessness individuals and families, um, which also include social services. So it provides counseling, case management, substance abuse treatment, specialized services for veterans, housing permanency services to connect eligible households to rental assistance program um, and delivered directly or in collaboration with other city agencies and community partners. We also have Home Base. Home Base is a community-based program that connects New Yorkers at risk of eviction and shelter entry. So this Home Base usually provides a lot of assistance with um, trying to avoid eviction. Um, and this, they also provide a range of services, um, including eviction prevention services like public benefits, education, job search assistance, financial counseling, money management, short-term financial assistance. Um, so it's an array of different services and this is all under home base. There is, we do have um, on our website, HRA, um, there are, there is more information on home base or the shelter system or rental assistance if you're interested in taking a look. And then we also have free legal assistance to prevent eviction. So there are um, Office of Civil Justice partners with legal services organizations across New York City to provide legal assistance to New, Yorker, New Yorkers facing eviction. Um, legal services are free and available in every zip code regardless of immigration status. You don't have to be an existing HRA client to apply. Um, they are available Monday through Friday between 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. to provide over the phone or legal advice to callers with legal questions or issues about tenancy evictions and landlord tenant disputes. Um, you are welcome to call 311 for the tenant helpline or email civiljustice at hra.nyc.gov. So I wanted to talk about one last service and that is the Community Food Connection. So the Community Food Connection um, funds over 700 soup kitchens and food pantries across the five boroughs of New York City. And basically they um, fund a lot of food pantries in order for these food pantries to be able to have the funds to help the community. So we do have a website that's called foodhelp.nyc.gov. I would encourage you all to just take a look at that website. It's super helpful because you are able to enter your zip code and it will generate a list of the closest food pantries around your zip code. Um, this could be organizations or churches or different um, agencies that provide um, food and they sometimes give them on a weekly basis or twice a month, I believe, but definitely explore that website to see all of the resources available in your zip code. And then lastly, I wanted to just quickly mention how you can reach us. So we do have the one number also known as the HRA info line. That is 718-557-1399. If you do have any questions in regards to any of the services I just mentioned or other services that I did not mention, and you're interested in learning more about, you are more than welcome to call that number. If you have an application that you submitted and you wanna know the status of the application, I would first encourage you to take a look at Access HRA to see if you are able to see the status or take a look at the e-notice section to see if you have any notices pending um, first. And then if you don't see any information there, I would definitely encourage you to call the one number to get information and speak to a live worker. Um, we are open Monday to Monday through Friday, sorry, from eight to five. If you do call after those hours or before those hours, you won't be able to speak to a live person. Um, so I just want to mention that. You are also able to go on our HRA website 
um, where we actually have a lot more resources and you can actually take a look at a list that we have on our website of organizations that actually assist with some of the applications. So if you're overwhelmed with all the information that I provide and you might want assistance, you can also contact one of the partner organizations so that they can assist you with that process. And I believe that is all I have for today. I'm so sorry, I feel like I went through that super fast. Vanessa, thank you. No apologies. Um, all of that was important information that needed to be shared. And yes, it's it's a lot. Um, but I'm sure that we'll we actually have plenty of questions already um, to address relating to to SNAP benefits and rental assistance and, and so forth. So thank you so much for that. Um, it's good to know that um, DSS has a a large offering of support services for um, for our workers. Um, so next up, we have Lars Thompson. Uh, Lars is the Associate Commissioner for UI Claims Processing and Quality Review for New York State Department of Labor. He oversees the intake of UI claims, benefit eligibility reviews, and federal state compliance assessments. Uh, I'm just gonna let Lars explain more as to what he does and what uh, our Department of Labor offers for for workers. There, found the mute there. Sorry about that. Thanks, Director, and thank you again, Commissioner, um, for having me here today on behalf of Governor Hochul and Commissioner Reardon. Um, just wanted to go through an overview here of the unemployment insurance program that the New York State Department of Labor runs here. Um, so as I'm in my deck, um, this website will come up again at the end of the slides. Uh, this is the best resource for all help. Uh, you can go to either one of those web addresses and all the information about the program uh, will be covered there. So a little bit about unemployment insurance. It is actually an insurance program. Uh, it is actually funded by employers um, and is a short-term income uh, for workers who become unemployed due to no fault of their own. And this includes all the workers impacted as a result of the strike, whether directly and or indirectly. Um, so again, employers pay for it, um, but then it's there for workers to get through these times. We'll get in a little bit more about uh, how long it covers and how much that is. There is qualification requirements. Um, there has to be a, an enough amount of work being conducted uh, in what's called a base period. I'll get into that in a little bit. Um, there is a minimum amount of earnings uh, shown here on the slide, $3,100. That's in a 13-week period. Um, and then you have to have more, more, more than just one quarter of work. And the most important thing is unemployed due to no fault of their own, which obviously this situation would, would, would cover. Uh, there is a base period, so this is how far back we go to look at all the earnings, to go through the calculations for how much people could be owed. Uh, as it says, it goes back for, it's called calendar quarters, so we go back for five of them. Um, we are coming up on what's called a quarter change soon, so if people had wages back into early 2022, that actually changes uh, for claims that would be filed starting at the beginning of July. Most important note on this slide here would be how much could you potentially be eligible for? Uh, the most is $504 per week, but the minimum is $124 per week. And that's a full benefit for people who are completely unemployed for the entire week. Um, if you are working, uh, you can report that work, but still be eligible for a partial benefit. Uh, for those who may not know um, how long it lasts, uh, your claim is open for an entire calendar year from the week that you open it. Uh, in that time, you can receive 26 weeks or roughly six months of benefits at that time. Um, there's a second bullet here I wanted to note um, the last time uh, I had the pleasure of, of speaking to this group. Uh, questions about extensions came up. Uh, unfortunately, just to reiterate, there are no extensions at this time. Extended benefits are only brought into place beyond the 26 weeks by really one of two conditions. Um, one would be a much higher unemployment rate statewide, not just industry specific, unfortunately. 
Uh, the other thing would be an act of Congress because unemployment insurance actually is a federally backed program. Uh, so that would be the only other way we could pay beyond the base 26 weeks. So um, again, just to reiterate, as far as unemployment insurance goes, it is just the 26 weeks within the year at this time. Uh, going back into some of the qualifications, um, again, unemployed due to no fault of your own. That means, you know, laid off, lack of work, um, you know, the strike is covered, um, things like that. Somebody was let go due to it just not working out, you know, poor performance, things like that. Um, you need to be totally out of work. You need to be otherwise ready and willing to work. If you are working, we talked about partial credit and it just, it'll end up producing the benefits, but you still can work and we want to make sure that happens. Uh, all of that, again, is covered on the website with the, with the specifics because you, you'll claim each and every single week. Um, here's some information we wanted to expand upon a little time for people who um, may have their own business that was has been impacted. Um, the takeaway from these two questions and the answers here on the slide are absolutely file a claim. You're more than welcome to and should if you're seeking the benefits. Don't make a decision on your own. Let us make the decision. Um, but there are some criteria for people, depending on your business structure, if you are self-employed, as to uh, how you may be eligible. Um, we do have a, a frequently asked questions page or an FAQ that does cover this, and uh, it is it can be found there as well. Again, when should you file for the first time? Do not wait. Um, make sure you file the first full week you're out. As part of the claims process, they will tell if you're eligible within that week or if you need to wait a week. Um, but the first week, you know you're fully out of work or working less than 30 hours and going to earn less than four, $504. Um, you have the whole week to file. You have from Monday to Saturday to file the claim. So uh, and how you're going to do that, we'll go over it shortly. Again, for those who may not be familiar with the process, uh, there's some information you'll, you'll need to bring to either, you know, we call in on the phone to use our phone system or go to the website to use our web system. And this covers some of the information there. We have some awesome, awesome videos and uh, and slides on our webpage um, where they'll actually walk you through the claims filing process before you file. So there's no reason to go in cold if you have if you're not familiar. Um, we fully understand that it's it can seem very um, you know challenging and, and and something that you know. Well, what am I going to need? There's a lot of questions. We do our best to try to make sure it's covered with the resources we have online. But just wanted to kind of highlight some of this information here. Again, where are you going to go? You're going to go online. Uh, online isn't open 24 hours a day. It has to do with how our, our system works. So you have from 7.30 to 7.30 each day to file online, but you can also apply over the phone um, during those times. And again, I spoke about some of the online resources. Uh, there's some web pages there. We have our Facebook, we have our Twitter. And also, um, just to highlight other parts of what the Department of Labor can offer workers is uh, a lot of on career training, um, in, in a multitude of areas. So that's also there in addition to job postings. Um, one note we wanted to flag here is the IDME process. Um, a little bit about what that is. We notify folks that they have to go through that. So you, you may be familiar with UI and have heard about this in the news or things like that. Not everyone needs to go through it. And if you do need to go through it, it'll note, we'll, we'll be notifying you of, of how to do that and, and what steps you would need to take. But just to reiterate, it's not a process that everyone needs to go through. Uh, when you receive your first payment, about three to six weeks, but that's at most. Um, and then, you know, that's after we, we process it. But one thing just to reiterate here um, is if you get any questionnaires or anything in the mail or any phone calls from the Department of Labor, just please make sure you return them right away. Once you return it, uh, the, the ball is in our court, so to speak, to, to respond to you. So as long as you've sent it back or you've called us back, then I assure you we will be you know reviewing the documents you sent back or calling you back to continue the process on. Um, and again, it, just keep certifying each week. If you are waiting uh, to have your claim processed, that we have that information on file. And when you're paid, you would be definitely paid all at once. So I've gone a little over time here, but just wanted to reiterate our websites. Um, our website links, again, they all go to the same website, uh, on.ny.gov slash UI, or you can just go to our main page, dol.ny.gov. Uh, again, our resources continue to grow by the week. Um, we listen to our feedback from our customers, and we're here to serve you, um, you know, at any time in any way you need us. So, uh, again, thank you for having me this afternoon, and I'm looking forward uh, to answering any questions you may have at the end of the uh, presentations. Thank you. Thank you, Lars, for that thorough presentation. Um, 
name. So just included some additional information on um, uh, S cores and subcontractors. So that's that's helpful. Um, all right, just a reminder to our attendees to please type in your question in the chat box and not the chat, the general chat box. Uh, there is a Q&A chat box. So please type your questions in there and we will pull directly from there at the end of this program. Uh, we'll, we will be devoting time for Q&As at the end of all our presentations. So thanks for your patience. Um, our next speaker is Lillian Galina. Uh, Lillian is, um, is a licensed clinical social worker and director of workplace initiatives at the Entertainment Community Fund, a human services organization serving all professionals in arts and entertainment. Um, so what was considered formerly the Actors Fund is now the Entertainment Community Fund. Her work at the fund focuses on providing community stakeholders, industry employers, and union leadership with support and connection to services for the members of the performing arts, with a focus on accessing mental health care, crisis intervention, and workplace challenges. Her team serves as a vital support for the industry. So, welcome, Galena. I'm um, sorry, Lillian. Sorry, I just have a little trouble. Thank you all for having me. Let me pull up my slides here. Hope everybody can see that. Great, um, thanks so much for having me. Yes, we were formerly the Actors Fund. Um, our mission here at the Entertainment Community Fund is really to serve all professionals in performing arts and entertainment. We are a national nonprofit organization, um, so we um, serve people in all 50 states, Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands, and we're here to make that um, safety net um, for professionals during their entire lifespan. Um, who we help? Uh, we really help everyone in performing arts and entertainment, so if your profession um, is part of the performing arts as film, television, radio, opera, theater, dance, um, and music. We offer a wide spectrum of programs and workshops, support groups, um, online resources, our individual services, um, both um, with health insurance and um, social services. We'll get into that in a little bit. Um, we do provide emergency financial assistance to those that are eligible, um, and really our goal is to support those unique needs, those essential needs um, of the people working in such a dynamic um, profession. Who is eligible for our services? So um, most of our services are available to everyone um, in performing arts and entertainment, and our financial assistance for um, emergency needs is ba based off of a couple of different factors, including work history and need. Um, all of our eligibility guidelines are listed online at entertainmentcommunity.org. Uh, we're also the stewards of um, several other funds in the community, in the entertainment community, and you can find out about those funds and the eligibility required to access those funds um, on our website. So I encourage you to take a look, see if you're eligible. You can submit an application online. You can also give us a call and email us if you have any questions. Our social services that includes our emergency financial assistance is such a vital program at the fund. Um, we support people um, as with mental health, which um, you know not just financial, although certainly impacted mental health is something that can also be impacted during this time during the strike. Uh, we have supports, assessments, and referrals, crisis support for people in the community, um, senior services, um, support for people with disabilities or living with HIV and AIDS. Um, challenges with addiction and recovery services we have, our emergency financial assistance, which we spoke about. Um, we also provide financial assistance and social services support for funerals and burials. Um, our financial wellness program um, during this time offers um, free and confidential Zoom support um, on budgeting, on investing, on credit and debt, um, how to stretch your dollars during these difficult times. Um, and we offer um, quite a few different support groups. Um, our support groups are run by social workers, 
um, that can help people um, come together during this difficult time, form community, um, and get support. Sometimes health insurance can be disrupted during um, a strike such as this. So we wanna make sure that people are aware that we do have health insurance experts and navigators here at the fund that can help people figure out the be best health insurance options for them at this time, whether that's changing. Uh, many of the uh, workers may not be earning weeks of work towards their health insurance. So we wanna make sure um, that folks know that we have some guidance and support. Uh, they can enroll people in a marketplace or a Medicaid or Medicare plan here at the fund. Um, and we can just talk you through some of those challenges that you may be facing um, with health insurance. We also offer um, our career center. Um, these services really help people in the entertainment industry look at the um, their whole career in a holistic way. So considering um, freelance work, entrepreneurial opportunities, um, thinking about discovering meaningful um, industry adjacent or sideline work or even transitioning to a new career. Um, so we have many different workshops throughout the week um, on resume writing, on networking, on building or managing a transition. Um, we also offer individual one-on-one -on -one career counseling um, for some folks. So it's important to know that you can access that. We have a career center orientation every Monday and Wednesday online on Zoom that you can sign up for to get started and have access to all of those great workshops throughout the week. Uh, we wanna make sure you know how to get in touch with us in New York City. That's our basic line, great way, info at entertainmentcommunity.org. Um, if you're looking for social services and emergency financial support, um, a great way is to go onto our website. You'll see a banner at the top that says emergency financial assistance. You can click on that. Um, it'll take you to our eligibility page, give you all of our contact info, and you can apply directly on our website. Um, thank you so much here to answer any questions. Just want folks to know that the Entertainment Community Fund is here to support you um, through this strike in a number of different ways. And please reach out if you're in need. Thank you, Lillian. Uh, all right, moving to our next speaker, we have um, we have Jalen Vasquez. Jalen is the freelancer sub director. Um, I believe Rafael has uh, the executive director, uh, Rafael Espinal, has had to leave for another meeting, but Jalen will be stepping in, uh, speaking on behalf of Freelancers Hub. Um, go ahead, Jalen, take it away. Hi, thank you for everything. Um, yeah, so hello, I'm Jalen Vasquez. I'm the director of Freelancers Hub. Uh, Freelancers Hub is a free co-working space for all workers in New York City. We are operated by the Freelancers Union and partnered with Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment. Uh, I'm just gonna little talk a little bit about the Freelancers Union first, and then I'll talk more about the Freelancers Hub and all of the services we provide. Um, so Freelancers Union is a nonprofit organization that we support individuals who want to pursue independent work. So especially in this time of need, if you're thinking about pursuing freelancing, whether if it's part-time, full-time, or even pivoting your career fully, we're here to help you for that. Um, we definitely recommend to go to our website, freelancersunion.org. I'll add a couple links in the chat in a bit. Uh, but we have a wonderful blog and a couple different resources as well provided by from members and we also have various discounts as well um, for our members and all of it's free to join we don't ask anything uh just a little bit of your info and just background info but we are here to help uh so a little bit more about our co-working space we are located in industry city brooklyn and sunset park hopefully it's not too far for you but we are a free co-working space uh, we offer free wi-fi we have free printing so if you need to come by print anything, whether if it's applications, resumes, um, any other paperwork. It also has a scanner and copier. All that's completely complimentary. We have three refreshments of coffee, tea, and light snacks. And then the biggest thing is we also offer free workshops. We generally have about eight to 10 workshops per month, all about business development. Uh, as a freelancer, they're tailored to very wide topics, whether if it's how to brand yourself, how to market yourself, pitch to potential clients, we also have things of like finances, legal workshops for contracts and things like that, just so you know how to protect yourself in the future. Um, a couple of other things that we do have as well, we do have a new program that we started a few months ago called the Knowledge Bar here. 
uh, where you can book a free one-on-one -on -one consultation with one of our member experts. We currently have four experts um, that you can talk to. Generally, they're here twice a month, uh, and it's all based on their um, availability, just because they, they're freelancers as well, and they do various things on their own time. So we have one person who you can talk to about digital tools and techniques and different software programs to help streamline your business. We have another person talk about branding, marketing, and social media. And then we also have two other experts. Uh, one is financial planner, talk to you about um, your business and retirement uh, finance planning. So if you have anything about that or you're worried about where your income is going to be, uh, he can definitely help you. And we have another final person who is a partner uh, representative actually from SBDC Brooklyn. Uh, he can help you with business development and also with grant funding and kind of find you those resources of what grants are available to you that you might be eligible for. Um, but yeah, we're just happy to have you with us. We're happy to help any way we can. Um, feel free. All of our staff is friendly. All of our members are friendly as well. If you have any questions about specific career path or just how to do something, our members are probably some of the best members ever. And the only way we can learn is by learning through one another and just having each other's backs. Um, so that's pretty much it for me. I will put a couple links in the chat for people to see, um, but thank you so much and thank you for your time. Thanks so much, Jalen. I uh, wanted to let our attendees also know that at the, there, um, there's a link on, I will add to the chat as well, that will provide a list of resources of all the resources mentioned today. Um, so there will be links coming your way for a list of resources. Right. So last but not least, we have Goldie Patrick. Uh, Goldie is a playwright and television writer, director, and cultural worker with over 20 years supporting artists, institutions, and nonprofit organizations seeking to amplify their impact, increase their community engagement, and build their capacity. Uh, Goldie is the programming director for the Dramatist Guild Foundation, and I'm going to let Goldie take it away. Thank you so much. All right, I'm going to share my screen, and I promise I'm going to do my best to make this quick so that you all can get your questions answered. So I'm excited to be here as a representative of the Dramatist Guild Foundation, um, and I wanted to put this slide up because I think it exemplifies and amplifies exactly what the mission of the Dramatist Guild Foundation is. You'll see on our website that the first thing you see is helping writers bring their important stories to light. But in a particular time that we're in right now, this photograph, I think, really demonstrates that. You'll see our uh, board member, Lynn Manuel Miranda, standing in solidarity on the picket lines. And while I'm here presenting with you um, excitedly as the Director of Grants and Programming for the Dramatist Guild Foundation, I also am here as a member of WGA East. And so the conversation and the information that I want to share with you all is really around those who may find themselves living between both industries of theater and writing for uh, Writing Guild of America and how those resources that the Dramatist Guild Foundation offers can serve you. When I speak of dramatists, I just want to clarify that dramatists include playwrights, lyricists, book writers, composers, all individuals that create those stories for theater and at any section of your career, regardless of your uh, location, your geography, regardless of your age, regardless of your professional experience, and regardless of any other aspects of your background. It's very important at DGF that we're inclusive of the entire diverse community of the dramatists we serve. And our programs are really built in two uh, perspectives. One is to support dramatists, and the other is to provide resources for dramatists. And I'll get into that a little bit later. The way that um, our programs are set up that serve dramatists are really under social protection uh, services and programs. And those are built and designed to try to respond to the needs of these dramatists with time, with intention, and with enough sustainability for them to be able to create the art that we all love. 
Here's a quick snapshot of the history of DGF. But what I will say is really important around our history is we were created by theater makers. We were created by Alan J. Lerner, who saw the need within the community and within the industry, just from peers and friends that needed a loan. And while he experienced his own professional success, what became important to him is to extend his resources to those who were in need. And it's the spirit of that giving that really continues to move us in D at DGF. And so we continue this loan or this grant opportunity. And we also uh, look at ways we can support the professional development of peers and, and community members inside the theater community. And we also seek to learn and listen so that we can understand and research the field that we're inside of and that we seek to serve. So our social protective programs exist inside the grants and the programming department. And there are five uh, resources that we offer. One are our emergency grants, and that's anything that's an unexpected cost. Our housing grants, which are rental or mortgage assistance. Then we have something newer called the bridge grant, which works directly to provide anything that may not be immediate or an emergency, but would help you out around your living expenses. We also have a group of awards that recognize development, merit, creativity, and talent within the field that offers financial support in that way. And then we have a fellowship, a series of fellowships that help with the professional development of dramatists. I want to talk today specifically about our grants, because I think the grants will be super helpful for those members that are seeking financial support and assistance at this time. Our emergency grants program is designed, it's a national program. That's the first and important thing, regardless of immigration status to any dramatist that is in the United States um, or the United States territories. And inside of that, regardless of whether you're a college student or if you're an elder playwright and something has occurred in your life that you were not financially prepared for, you can apply for an emergency grant. And inside of that, you'll demonstrate what your need is. You'll give us an example of how you live as a dramatist. And what we'll get an opportunity to do is to look through all of the things that you've experienced and work our best to meet what your ask is. Your ask can be as simple as, I need $500, I need $700 to, I unexpectedly have this condition and I need $6,000. We work with a committee of peers of dramatists that help us evaluate and measure how we can best meet the needs of the dramatists that apply. Emergency grants, it can be anything from mental health uh, services, legal services, loss or damage, equipment, tools, or um, an emergency that maybe we haven't even thought of that you're experiencing. The second one is our housing grants. Our housing assistant grants are when you are in an experience where perhaps it is directly connected to your ability to pay rent, your ability to pay your mortgage, um, a national, a natural disaster that has interrupted your livelihood or in some way created a need for you to do renovations on your home, not on the luxury side of the renovation, but on the, the vitality and the survival side. And through the housing assistance grant, we do something similar in terms of the emergency grants. We look at the need, we go to our resource pool, we go to a community of reviewers where it's necessary and needed, and we work to figure out how we can best meet your need with the resources we have in place. Now, we also have something called a bridge grant. A bridge grant is for a situation where perhaps you wouldn't deem it an emergency. Maybe you need support around transportation because your uh, accounting didn't allow you to really be in a position to drive your car or pay for parking or get a Metro card. Uh, perhaps you need support around therapy this month or some type of mental health service that your insurance company doesn't cover or provide. Perhaps you are responsible for a dependent and you care for them and you would like support. Perhaps you work with an interpreter. Um, any of those things, you can apply for the bridge grant. The bridge grant is significant because there is a $500 uh, amount given to it, and we can expedite that payment. So based on your need, you can find yourself between the emergency grants, the housing grants, or our bridge grants. 
In addition to that, we understand at Dramatist Guild Foundation that sometimes the creative process incurs costs that we aren't prepared for. And we wanna do all that we can to make sure that creatives have the, state, the space to create their best work. And so we have these writing rooms that are available for you. They're located at our office at 528th Avenue. They are completely free to dramatist. You can come into our space and write, compose, sit with your lyricist, come up with new ideas. Once you've done that, if you need a free space to present that work, you can come and present in our music hall space and invite your guests. This is a way that we wanna honor and acknowledge that sometimes the cost for becoming a creative may be a, um, maybe detouring you from doing your best work. And we want to try to create inspiration where maybe there is a, a barrier. So we encourage you to sign up to use our space. Our space will be available for reservations starting in August. All writers know editing is part of the process. So we're doing our own editing of the space and we want to make sure we have everything in place to best serve you. So starting August 1st, our space will open up for new reservations. Quickly, the process to apply for either the emergency grants, the housing assistant grants, and or the bridge grant. These grants are one time, uh, are awarded only once. So you want to be clear on what the need is as you apply. Um, and we will work with you. It's not transactional. We're trust-based. We operate with a trust-based uh, philanthropy, but we also want to incorporate you as part of the community. You'll go online to our website, uh, www.dgf.org emerg backslash emergency dash grants backslash. And then there you'll see the application process. It looks just like the picture in this slide. You'll submit your proof of work. The easiest way to do that is to submit a resume in addition to uh, pages from a script similar to what you would do for any other kind of submission of your work or a play. Um, and then from that, we'll look over the materials, we'll communicate with you around your need. We ask that you be specific with your, your need if you're applying for housing and you need support around your rent. Please provide rental statements and or a lease so we know the amount. Um, and then where we need, we'll go to a committee review of peers They'll help us make the best decision. We'll communicate with you and let you know the status of your application. Right now, we're experiencing an influx of, influx of applications. So give us about four weeks. That four weeks is the time period from you submitting your application to you receiving the deposit into your bank account. Um, we are motivated and moved by the dramatists that we serve, and we are interested in always hearing how we can best serve you. We encourage you to stay in contact with us, visit our space, stay present on our website. Um, if you want, if you are around with social media, please log in. It's not only a way of having conversation, but it's also a way to stay updated with the resources that we provide. So we are located on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Join us, follow us. Um, um, and also, it's a it's a community where you can have dialogue with what your needs are, and we can listen and learn. Thank you so much for all that you do, all that you've created. We recognize this industry would not exist without you. Thank you for this opportunity. I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Goldie. What a wealth of resources through the uh, Dramatist Guild Foundation. That uh, we, this was actually new new information for us. So really great to know that there are all these grants and available uh, resources through the foundation. Um, okay, so we are at the end of the hour. However, uh, if our panelists are okay with us extending another fifteen minutes to answer questions, that would be wonderful. If you can stay on for that, um, you now we're going to pull questions. Um, from our Q&A box first. I know I see questions in the chat box, but let's let's start with the Q&A box. Um, first question, this is actually, this is for Vanessa. Vanessa, um, the question is, I've applied for government assistance through HRA and haven't received anything. Um, I applied May 4th, near, nearly two months ago. Um, let's see. So what other, so this is not a question, but essentially I think you've covered it. Um, right, so 
they this person has not I've sent my first application May 4th. I've uploaded documents three times and can't get a hold of anyone. Should I just show up to the office? So um, what is the process when they have not received a response from HRA to their application? Yeah, good question. So I'm going to add in the chat three resources. So the first one is going to be the DSS HRA one number. That's also known as the HRA info line. Um, I would say try that number, but that might be the number that you mentioned that you can't get through. Again, usually Mondays and Fridays are high volume. Um, I think there is an option that when you call, you can indicate you want to be called back, but still stay in line. So that is an option that you have. Um, the second resource I have that I'm going to share is the constituent service uh, affairs email address. So you can email them there, let them know that you've been trying to get in contact and you still don't know the status of your case and it's been over 30 days. Um, the last option I'm going to provide is the website where you can actually get connected to an organization that's partnered with HRA and typically they have other avenues of advocacy when people have concerns or issues with their case. Um, I'm putting all of that in the chat so that you can um, use some of these options or all these options. Um, but definitely, I would say if you do want to go in person, you're more than welcome to go in person and ask for the status of your case and just mention that it's been over 30 days. Thanks, Vanessa. I think this is a similar question. Um, person says that they've applied for staff benefits, they've had a phone interview as required, during which they confirmed all the information included for the application. However, a month later, they received a notice of decision on your supplemental nutrition assistance in the mail that said not approved because this, this person did not complete the required interview, which they did. Um, they contacted the, the East End SNAP Center, also called the main number, has been put in a queue, wait time was very long. Um, so essentially they did do the interview, was denied saying that they didn't do the interview um, and still can't get a hold of, of, of anyone, so. Yeah, I would say for this particular scenario, I would maybe say to go into the website and look for a partner organization because some of these partner organizations that are on that website actually do have an avenue for SNAP only cases issues that they can advocate on your behalf. If you did complete a step in that process and you were denied and it's not correct, they can definitely assist with that process and, and get it straightened out. So I would say definitely reach out to one of those partner organizations that appear on that website. You can also um, request a fair hearing. So on the decision that you receive, there is an option on that, on that decision notice where you can actually apply for a fair hearing. You can go up and speak to a judge and you know just let them know that you did complete that process and provide your proof and they are able to overturn if they find that you did in fact complete that interview process. I'm sorry, what? Is the ASTA uh, entertaining community fund that they help with these students? They might be one of the partners she's talking about. Um, okay, so this is a question. Uh, Lillian, does the entertainment community fund also assist with food stamps are, are you a partner um we would we would give out the same information so in terms of helping somebody um through the application our social workers are happy to do that if they're engaged in engaged in case management but we don't have any direct connection um, to snap benefits um, other than you know helping them access the resources that were presented here today Right, going through the questions and, and going through as many questions as possible, given the time that we have. Um, sure answer that. This is this is a very specific question for for Lars, um, the Department of Labor. This person's asking, when filing for unemployment, 
there's a question. If you get worked through, through a union hiring hall, I'm IA, I'm in, I'm in IOTC and we do not have a hiring hall, but mm -hmm. I was once told to check this box because I'm in a union. Was this correct advice? Yeah, I just saw that. I was debating, do I type it or do we speak to it? And I figured we'd get to it. So it's a great question. Um, you would check that. It's an, kind of a throwback, the hiring hall term. You, we've got some things in UI that go back 50, 60, 70 years to just a different time. But basically, if you're a union member and you only work union jobs, then it would be in, ostensibly through a hiring hall. Like Because what it's a data point. It doesn't change anything on your claim. It just lets us know that you're only going to be accepting union work because that's the nature of your employment. So um, if you're somebody who does both, you don't have to check that. Again, it doesn't change your claim or make you eligible for anything different. It's just something on our end. It has to do with, you know, there's laws that protect union members during periods of unemployment on what type of work you have to take. And if, you know, you're a union member, you only take union work. We don't have to, you know, have you go for a look for other work. So not incorrect to check that box. Hopefully that helps. Thank you for raising that. Another question related to unemployment. Uh, this is someone who, let's go here. Uh, let's go to unemployment, hold on. For those who worked, I know we've answered this before, but in, in the previous webinar, but for those who worked on a film or TV project in New Jersey, but are residents of New York, are they eligible for unemployment in New York? Many projects are shot in New Jersey. So the best, you can file in either state, the state in which you work and which your wages are paid, or the file in the state with which you live. Um, we, we deal with that a lot between other states, especially in the city area where you've got the tri-state area. So you could have wages and people work in other states. So my advice to you would be if the, if your work is primarily in New Jersey, file in the state in which you work, but they will coordinate with us as well. If a claim should be in another state, uh, I will say New Jersey potentially could have a higher rate too. So try there first, but. So. You're essentially, for, for whatever state that you've worked in, apply for un unemployment benefits within that state. That's usually how it works. But again, you've got the right to, you know, you can file with us here and we can work on it as well. But usually we'll, we'll direct where the wages are, are typically reported, which is usually where the work occurs. Okay. Um, I, and I think you provided this information too. This is a follow-up about contacting Department of Labor. Um, this person says, I applied and was approved for unemployment insurance early May, and everyone I know in my similar situation has started to receive payments, but I still haven't received any. Is there anything I can follow up? It's it's difficult to reach anyone when you call. Yep, I reached out to that person under separate cover, so um, we'll uh, we'll do what we can to help. Appreciate you reaching out. Great. Right. Cool. Uh, okay. Can you answer all these questions? Yes, let's do it. Okay, this is this is for Goldie. Um, my husband is a script writer and independent filmmaker who retired just this past year from working for the city to focus on independent filmmaking. Does the Dramatist Guild Foundation offer grants and resources for script writers looking uh, working on film projects? So our our priority are theater makers. So if uh, if your husband has a background as a playwright or book writer, in addition to be a in addition to being a filmmaker, then yes, they would be eligible. But if their experience is solely in the filmmaking world, unfortunately, we don't uh, work with the filmmaking world. All right. So I think we've answered the bulk of questions. Um, are there any last thoughts or words of encouragement from our from our panelists that you can, you would like to share before we we end our webinar? Anyone? Um, if not, 
Mm -hmm. That's the question. Um, if I live outside New York State, what benefits? And then we did ask. We did ask that question. Okay. All right. Thank you, everyone. This was incredibly helpful. Um, I hope it was incredibly helpful for our, our attendees. And again, it's being recorded and will be uploaded to YouTube to, to watch later. Please share amongst your colleagues and anyone you know who would benefit from, from this information. Um, thank you again to our esteemed panelists. Uh, we appreciate your time and we'll continue to monitor the situation um, as we go forth. Hopefully uh, the duration won't be too long, but we'll continue to monitor and and um, continue to provide support and as such as this um, in terms of information and resources. So thank you again, and we'll be in touch. <laughs>